All right, guys, I think we're ready to go. It's, uh, it's five after, so there's a couple of pieces of paper uh, going around. So if you're uh, in one of my classes and you're supposed to get some sort of credit for showing up, make sure your name's on a piece of paper. If not, just come to me after class and I'll, I'll make sure I have your name down. But I know artist from here, very good. It's called the geographer, so I thought it was appropriate for this talk. So <laughs> you can see his uh, paintings, a couple of maps in the background, and a globe. So anyway, all right. So every year on campus, we have uh, a theme. What do you think our theme is this year? Myth and reality. So the title of my talk is "How to Lie with uh, Maps and Climate Data." Who's who? Who's that? I don't expect anybody, <laughs> anybody to know who that is. But he's kind of a famous social scientist and geographer and economist. His name's Edward Boulding. And see, he's quite an accomplished uh, guy. He's, he's actually passed away. But he was president of uh, American Economic Association. Uh, you can see all those publications that he's got there, over 1,200. That's uh, pretty pretty good, actually. My point, putting his picture up there, is one of his famous quotes is, our behavior is determined by what we think the world is like, not by what it is actually like, right? So our behavior is determined by our perception of reality, not actually reality, right? So that's kind of a starting off point. And actually, another famous guy just recently passed away, Leonard Nimoy. Uh, science officer for uh, Star, uh, Star uh, Enterprise, Starship Enterprise, sorry. Um, so actually, my question, uh, sometimes I ask some questions because it actually helps me lead the talk. So what is the scientific method? Buddy? Scientific method is what? What's the first step of the scientific method? Oh, yeah. Observations, very good. So I can see I have a couple of students in my <laughs> classes. So we make observations about the world. So we have five senses. So we make observations about the world. And then, well, what else? What's the second step of the scientific method? So after we make these observations, what do we do? We form a question, a research question, right? So we form a research question. And then after the research question, what do we do? Formulate a hypothesis, and the hypothesis is what? Educated guess or a tentative uh, kind of answer to the research, uh, research question, right? And so then what's the next step? After the uh, hypothesis development, we kind of develop this educated guess to the research question. What do we do then? Starts with an E. Experimentation, very good. So then we design experiments, and well, <clears throat> I think I've gone through this in most of my classes, but some of you guys aren't my students. So what are the experiments designed to do? Test the hypothesis, but are they designed to prove or disprove the hypothesis? Disprove the hypothesis, very good. So why are the hypotheses made to disprove the hypothesis? Why would that be? Because what? should get those sign-in sheets so I can call on your name, right? Because we only have to disprove the hypothesis how many times before we know that it's not true? Just once, right? So we only need to disprove the hypothesis once before we know the hypothesis isn't true. Uh, and then, if, of course, we, if, we, if we disprove the hypothesis through our experimentation, we could uh, design new experiments and we can uh, kind of modify our hypothesis and well, eventually, if we can't disprove our hi hypothesis, we elevate our hypothesis to a theory or a law. And so th those are the highest orders of uh, understanding, right? A theory or a law. So, well, already I could tell that my talk has generated some controversy from some of my colleagues on campus. 
I'd like to say that I'm the only professionally trained uh, climatologist on campus, so I'd like to think that my opinion means something, my professional opinion, so uh, I'll try to distinguish between uh, facts and my opinions during this talk. But in any case, I'd like to take the moral high ground because I feel like when your character is assassinated because you don't believe in uh, what the general uh, consensus is, it's hard to defend yourself. So I'm trying to take the moral high ground, even though I'm down in the pit. <laughs> Nobody's even brave enough to get in the front row. <laughs> hey, one guy. Um, well, so here are my two dogs. They both passed away, but dog on the right, Dalmatian, her name was Dottie. That's predictable, right? <laughs> I was driving home from work one day and saw her uh, scurrying her around on the side of the road, running in and out of traffic, almost getting run over, and uh, she looked really scared, so I spent a lot of time chasing her down, actually. It took me about an hour. And uh, if you know anything about the Dalmatians, they're, they're pretty fast, actually. They're, they're kind of like greyhounds, a little bit smaller. But uh, actually, I ended up catching her across the street from my house. So there's a like <laughs> catch her, walk across the street. Oh, I guess we're home. Now I got a dog. <laughs> well, <laughs> my girlfriend at the time then was looking at this mini schnauzer on the uh, schnauzer rescue website of Delaware. And so actually, purebreds, they have a lot of... Uh, genetic disorders because they're inbred so uh, schnauzers in particular have uh, they're, they're predisposed to get detached retinas and so that guy was completely blind and his name was Max and so girlfriend was watching him for several years or several months uh, about six months finally uh, I was uh, beaten down and uh, convinced that uh, nobody was going to adopt this guy so it should be on my <laughs> on my tab, I guess. So I adopted that guy. And well, I guess I'm a bit of a snob. The Dalmatian was so attached to me that I never needed a leash. I would just uh, walk around, and she would just follow me around. And so I kind of got used to that. Uh, didn't like to use a leash. But obviously, the blind dog, he needs a leash but I'm still kind of snobbish, and I didn't want to deal with that. So I, uh, you see, tethered the male dog to the female dog. And so basically, she was his seeing eye dog. She would just drag him around, and uh, there was the result. And it actually worked out pretty well. This is in the park. But if I put him in my backyard, actually, we had an a in-ground pool in the backyard, Max, he only fell in the pool twice, I think. Uh, both on the first day. <laughs> you know, and I was right there by his side, you know, pull, scooped him out of the pool pretty quickly. But after that, he never fell in the pool again. And when we put him in the house, occasionally he'd run into the, into the wall if he was chasing a cat around. I have two cats, too. Uh, that's a different story. That'll be, that'll be for the next next year's talk, but um, Maxi, yeah, he got around pretty well, so why was he able to navigate around so well? Because what? I think we talked about this in some of my classes, so if you're a former student, don't feel ashamed to uh, shout out the answer. What did he have in his head? A map. He had a map of the world in his head, right? So he was able to uh, kind of navigate around because he knew what his surroundings were like. And so, well, there are many different types of maps. Here's a bunch of different types of maps. I guess my question for you guys is, I love these things. I feel so powerful. <laughs> I get to walk around in the classroom. And I Actually, when you guys sit in the back of the room, then I get to go to the back of the room and look around and see if you're taking any notes. And it's uh, $40. This is well worth the $40. So what is a map? Words have meanings. So what is a map? It's a tool. 
So actually, Homo sapiens, we're, uh, I guess, I don't know what the, the formal definition is. I should have probably looked it up. But we're uh, the tool users, the tool makers, right? We design tools. We uh, use tools. And we use maps. And so more formally, what would you say a map is? We, we use a map to do what? Here's a little picture of a map. Richmond, Virginia, I just picked a random map, put it up there. When you think of a map, what do you most commonly think of? Sea dog. <laughs> Sorry to call on you, but you always bust my chops in class, so I figure out. <laughs> right, so it's a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. Very good. So, And most of the time, you guys probably all have these smartphones right now that they have these uh, kind of map applications, right? Google Earth, and you use them to navigate around. You can even get these uh, kind of voices that uh, talk into your ear and annoy you. Turn left here and, and turn into the river or something like that. But maps, they're tools, right? They're tools that we use for navigation. But they're not only used for navigation. What else are they used for? A bunch of uses for maps. So they're not just used for navigation. Someone different. I should try to get some someone different. One of the sunny faces back there. I'll try to remember. Philip, how are you? <laughs> Very good. So maps can be used right, maps can be used for, for uh, analysis of topography. So we use them to represent the Earth's, uh, Earth's surface in a convenient format, topography. But I guess the most basic thing that we can use maps for is analysis. So we said that maps are tools. They're an, an analytical tools that we can use them to uh, kind of explore our, our planet right, and explore our surroundings. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of examples. Well, the first one that I always like to bring up is uh, epidemiology, so the spread of diseases. So we know all about uh, Ebola that's been uh, kind of in the news in the last uh, year or so. So anybody know who this is? Grandfather of uh, epidemiology? Yes. Think about cold regions, that white stuff that falls down there. Snow? So, Dr. John Snow. And so he was the first person to uh, actually discover the cause for the uh, cholera epidemic in London. And so actually, he made a map. And so he was actually able to figure out the cause of the cholera epidemic because of uh, the map that he made. And it killed 60 people. You might not think that that's that many people, but that's. Uh, well, if you're one of those 60 people, <laughs> and pretty significant, right? So, well, how is cholera spread? It's spread by um, bacteria, right? And so usually human excrement that gets into the, uh, the water well, not a good thing for business, right? So diseases are spread that way. So here's a, a little uh, electron microscope uh, image of some cholera bacteria. You can see here, I think some of you guys have taken my class. What's that little mu m stand for? Micrometer. So that's a millionth of a meter. So those are uh, actually pretty small. So that little, uh, that little line on the bottom is a millionth of a meter. So all those are little bacteria cells, just one millionth of a meter long, pretty small. And well, so Dr. John Snow, he figured out that this well, this water well in London, was the cause of the cholera outbreak. And how did he do that? Well, this was his map. He made this map. And basically what he did was he was kind of taking a census. He went around, and all the people that were sick came to him, and he talked to them, well, where do you live? And so he started drawing little lines and kind of made up a, a rudimentary map. And that's the map that he came up with. And based on this map, I don't have a pointer that can reach up there, but you can kind of see those little black dots where they're concentrated. Well, 
he kind of figured out that, well, there has to be something at the place uh, where those little dots are concentrated, and he figured out that it was that well that I just showed in the previous picture, and he figured out that the water well was uh, contaminated by making a what? A map. Very good. All right. So we know that maps can be used to study the spread of diseases. We've, uh, we know we have the, the flu in the United States, and well, I've got my flu shot, but I don't like when you guys cough on me. You're always coughing on me, so I, I try to I try to stay uh, stay inoculated. I'm not trying to make this a political talk. I'll, I don't really care about stuff like this, but well. Here we see kind of a map of Iraq, biological, chemical weapons. I used to work at the World Trade Center, so it's actually highly personal for me. Uh, yeah, I used to work at the World Trade Center, actually. Uh, when was that? Yeah, obviously, before 9-11. <laughs> So actually, I did landscaping there. So um, yeah, this is a map of Westchester County. Anyone know what the? Anyone take a guess what those purple dots represent? Actually, they represent gun owners. So someone in New York thought that it would be a great idea to uh, put all these little purple dots and try to, I guess what you say is out all the uh, the gun owners in West Ch Westchester County. And if you look at this map, it looks like there's so many guns that, well. However, they publish the names and addresses of these people. And what do you think the names and addresses, who do you think these people are, many of them? Uh, police, law enforcement agents, judges, yeah. All sorts of people that might have uh, bad characters trying to uh, assassinate them. So a little bit short-sighted. So again, not trying to make this political. I think I've tried to show both sides of the aisle, kind of conservative, maybe uh, a lot of uh, people would say we shouldn't have invaded Iraq, whatever. Maybe a lot of people think we shouldn't have guns. Again, I'm just trying to give you guys a broad overview for how maps are used. So again, not trying to make a political statement here, but just trying to demonstrate the importance of maps. So we know that maps are important. We know what they're used for. They're analytical tools. How are they constructed? What are they? Sorry, keep pacing around. Good camera work there. What are they? Maps are what? Projections, and they're called projections because what? What is this screen right here? What's being projected onto that screen? An image, right? Light, very good. So how are maps con constructed? Uh, they're constructed by projecting an image. And so actually, they're representations of what? Here we see a little picture, well, another fallacy, I, I guess sometimes people like to say, we never landed on the, uh, the moon, right? That's a common conspiracy theory there. Um, but here you see a picture of the Earth from the moon. So the Earth is what? Round, a sphere, right? It's a three-dimensional object. So actually, all maps are what we said, I think, a few minutes ago. They're what? Two-dimensional uh, representations of a three-dimensional object. Very good. And so when we navigate around on the Earth, well, how do we navigate around? We first, we have to do what? Establish what? Coordinate grid system, right? So we establish lines of uh, latitude and longitude. So which lines do we see there on the left under A? Latitude, right? And so lines of latitude are centered on what? The equator, and they measure distance north and south of the equator. And they're also called what? They're they're always the same distance for one, from one another, so they're called parallels. Very good. And then, of course, uh, under B there on the right, we call those, what, meridians or what else? Lines of longitude. Very good. And so, well, it's my first time. I was 
I wouldn't say teaching. Actually, it's a pretty challenging uh, presentation to give because when it's a classroom, I can just give you an F if you leave. But actually, I have to keep you guys entertained. So I do appreciate your attendance. So thank you guys all for uh, showing up and uh, paying attention. So I do appreciate that. So we have our lines of longitude and our lines of latitude, our meridians and our parallels. And so, well, I don't have all the props that I usually have in my teaching room, but if you can imagine that I had a globe. So if you imagine that there's a light inside of that globe, it's called a projection because if, if you can imagine that we had a light bulb and we turned it on inside of that globe, the light would shine through that globe, right? And the lines of latitude and longitude would be projected into space along with anything else that was drawn on, those, uh, on that globe, continents, rivers, cities, so on and so forth, right? So, well, there's a couple of different ways that we can hold that piece of paper or this screen, I guess, up to the globe. So we have that globe, we have the light bulb inside of it that we turned on, all the light is projecting outwards into space. And well, <clears throat> I can't reach that high. But you can see there's three basic ways that we can hold the piece of paper up to the globe and we can make three basic types of maps. So we can have uh, a flat surface, the one on the left. We could have a conic surface. So if you could think back to uh, grammar school, I always used to get stuck in the corner. <laughs> the dunce cap, right? There's hope for you still. So we could have the cone, or we could have what else? What's the last one? Cylindrical projection. So we could uh, kind of wrap the piece of paper in a cylinder and, and drop it around the globe. And well, that cylindrical projection is known as the Mercator projection. And because we're representing that, um, three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional piece of paper, all maps have what? Distortion, very good. And so, a year of uh, myth and reality is that all maps have distortion. No map is a perfect representation of the Earth. So there are three types of distortion. And well, what are those three types of distortion? If you're my student, you probably know what they are. What are they? Just put them up there. Size, shape, and direction, right? So we can distort the size of objects, we can distort the shape of the objects, or we can distort the direction. And well, Maps have purposes. We said there are tools, right? So every map is designed for a specific purpose. And well, all maps are, are designed to limit one of those three types of distortion. So depending on the use of the map, the map might be designed to limit the distortion of size. It might be dis uh, designed to limit the shape of, or limit the distortion of shape, or limit the distortion of direction. So maps, that's their purpose. They're, they're a tool, and they're usually made to, to limit one of those three types of uh, distortion. So I guess if we go back to the Mercator projection. Mercator projection, well, if you look at, um, I don't have a little pointer here, but if you look at the South Pole, what continent is that down there at the South Pole? Antarctica, very good. And I always see it misspelled. Remember that C in there, Arctica, right? Well, What's wrong about Antarctica on that map? It's very big. It's much bigger than it is. It's not as big as North America or not even close to the size of Africa. So we can see that its size has actually been distorted. What else about it has been distorted? The shape has been distorted, right? So all maps have three components. What are the 
uh, what are the three components? So we have points. So think about if you represent a city on a map, you just put a dot, right? What else are there? If you represent a river, how do you represent it? Line. And if you represent a country, how do you represent it? A uh, shape or a polygon. So all maps are composed of points, lines, and polygons. All right. Questions, comments, problems? <laughs> I don't see any uh, torches or pitchforks, so I, I guess I'm doing all right. All right. What else? Well, so that's the basics of maps. So I'm a geography professor. So therefore, I thought I should say something about maps and how they distort our views of the world. Talk about distortion. Um, so those are all. Actually, this is just an example. So if we had those pieces of paper, right? And if we had the same human head and we held that piece of paper up to the globe in different ways, we can see that that head would look very different depending on how we held that piece of paper up. So that's our example of our, our distorted heads. And uh, I guess, obviously, you showed up. So probably you saw the advertisement for this. Uh, so you might notice or rec uh, recognize some of those uh, pictures. Who's that? Mark Twain, very good. Where am I going with this? What's the title of this talk? <laughs> How do I with maps and climate data? So we're transitioning to the climate. So what did Mark Twain have to say about climate? This is, the, this is one of his uh, famous quotes, is actually, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. So, climate, exactly. Well, we're all in Southern California, so it's, yeah, yeah, Phil. <laughs> yeah, he did say that, didn't he? So, um, that's why I don't live in San Francisco, actually. So, when LA gets ripped off along with Baja Peninsula and moves up to uh, to San Francisco. That's a, that's when I'll move. But uh, yeah, so climate is what we expect. Weather is what you get. So, well, I guess my question to you guys is: I've been studying climate for the past twenty years, so I feel like my professional opinion means something. I guess. I hope so. Climate is long-term study of weather. How many of you guys have taken statistics before? And so, have you ever heard there's a, that saying, maybe, hopefully you heard it from your uh, statistics professor, there's liars, damn liars, and statisticians? <laughs> you guys heard that before, right? So, stats, Statistics, they can be made to, to lie. Maps can also be made to lie. And so actually, uh, climate maps incorporate statistics. So they can be made to uh, deceive, not just, and not maybe sometimes even intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. But so climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. So that's uh, Mark Twain. So actually, one of the first things I learned when I was taking meteorology, lots of times you'll hear people say, this isn't normal. And then I shake my head. <laughs> because normal, that doesn't mean anything, actually. What's normal? We're talking about statistical probabilities, right? So. We talk about measures of central tendency. So everybody asks at the beginning of class, uh, man, doesn't want to erase. 
Do I grade on what? The curve. Very good. I don't grade on a curve. You guys score on a curve, right? So we have A's, B's, C's, D's, F's. So this is the what we call normal probability distribution, right? So most people get the average. So we, we call the, the mean Mean, median, and mode. So those are our measures of central tendency. So how we kind of determine what the probability distribution is like. And well, I guess my question to you guys is, well, I don't know how old you guys are. You're pretty young, but hopefully you voted in the last election if you were eligible, if not. But when they do all those polls, they don't sample every person on the uh, in the United States, right? There's 320 million people in the United States. They don't go around and uh, ask every person who they're going to vote for. What do they do? They, they take a sample, right? And so how many people do we need in the sample before it assumes this normal probability distribution, I guess? So those of you who have taken uh, statistics, what's that minimum size that you need before you can kind of say, Uh, not a thousand yet, much less than that. Much easier than a thousand. If you randomly sample, about, no, it's even lower than that. 30, yeah, 32, 33. So actually, at 32 or 33, all of a sudden, the population distribution takes on that kind of uh, bell shaped curve that we call it, and you can uh, run some statistics. But what does that mean? In terms of climate, well, what was that big hurricane to hit Louisiana a couple of years ago? Katrina. What was the one that hit New Jersey a few years ago? Sandy. And then after Sandy, actually, the next year, there was a bunch of uh, tornadoes that, that moved through the uh, Midwest. And what do we have going on in California right now? A drought. And everybody likes to start shouting around and kind of making all sorts of assumptions and saying, oh, this is climate change, right? Is that, is that legitimate? No, why not? Because how many years do you need based on the statistics, probability distribution? At least 30, right? So you need 30 years. You need over 30 years of climate just to make a, a baseline climatology to even compare our modern climate to or modern weather and events. So I guess that's the point that I'm trying to bring, bring across is that just because there's kind of one extreme event, and like I said, I put that picture of uh, Mark Twain up in climate is what you expect, but weather is what you get. We're supposed to have extremes. We're supposed to have uh, droughts. We're supposed to have um, hurricanes, we're supposed to have tornadoes. These extreme events, that's actually normal. So that's my point, actually. Um, how do we represent climate? Here are different climate regions of the world. I'm not gonna, there's no quiz at the end of this class, so don't worry about this map, but uh, too much. But all those different colors, there's a bunch of letters there, designations. I don't even actually have you guys memorize that for my classes. I feel like it's too much. I feel like if you're able to access information quickly, that, that's, uh, that's good enough for me. But the colors mean something there. So what do you think the greens represent? Rainforest. Tropical rainforest. The blues and the purples represent what? The cold regions, right? So we can see that, well, there are a few controls of climate. What are, what's the first predominant control of climate? What's the the major one. Latitude. latitude, right? So how far north or south of the equator we are. So we talked about those lines of latitude and longitude. So obviously the further we are from the equator, the less direct the sun's rays are, so it's going to be a little bit colder. And so we represent climate based on two variables. And what are those two most important variables? temperature and precipitation. So that's what these graphs show right there. 
These graphs show uh, temperature and precipitation. So the red lines show what? Temperature. The, the little purple bars represent what? Precipitation. So actually, both these locations are in the tropics, and I chose uh, one location that's close to uh, close to home, right, Los Angeles. So we're just uh, that's pretty much where we are, right? And so we can see that. Well, if we look at these two graphs, we notice that the annual temperature range, not that great, right? So if we're near the tropics, or the closer we are to the tropics, it'll get hot during the summer, cold during the winter. So we have this kind of curve. And the closer we are to the poles, what's going to happen? The ga greater extremes of the, of the climate, right? So greater temperature range. So if we're near the poles, it will be uh, hotter in the summer, colder in the winter. So you can see that in, in uh, the kind of these mid-latitudes, temperature not that extreme changes. But we also notice that there's a, a little bit of an annual range of precipitation. Actually, we're in the wet season right now for California. We've had a little bit of rain recently. So if you look at those uh, little bar graphs, it kind of makes sense because we're in March. And so we've had some rain in February and March. And so that makes sense. But what do you notice about those two graphs? One's in South Africa, one's in Los Angeles. About those two graphs, what's the biggest uh, thing that you notice? The timing is the opposite, right? So, because one's in the southern hemisphere. So, what causes our seasons on the Earth? The axial tilt with respect to the sun. So, a lot of people think it's the Earth's sun distance. So, well. I get into some debates with my colleagues about global warming, climate change. And then I'll be called a climate denier and all that sort of good stuff. I throw up my hands. I don't deny that there's a climate. The question is, what's causing changes in our climate. So our climate's always been changing throughout geologic time. How old is the Earth? 4.5 billion years old, right? 4.5 to 4.6 billion years old, so pretty old. And so, well, lots of times people say, Mike, you're crazy. Climate change, we should all be worried. 99% of all scientists believe in climate change, and we have to act now. <sighs> Why doesn't that worry me? 99% of climate scientists? That doesn't mean anything to me. That's not evidence. What's the evidence? Let's, let's focus on the evidence, right? Who was that guy? He said, um, the Earth orbits around the sun. <laughs> Ninety-nine percent of people said that uh, he was out of his mind too, right? And then, uh, so doesn't doesn't phase me to be the one percent that disagrees. So sorry if I uh, kind of don't agree with everything that's uh, put out there in the news, so to speak. So. Don't be afraid to disagree. I mean, we're, we're focused on the evidence, right? We want to look at the evidence. So what is the evidence? Well, that's it. Like I said, I've been doing this a long time, studying climate. Over 20 years, I don't know. Probably shouldn't probably date myself, but I'm 41. I know I look young and I look cool, but I'm pretty old. So 
when I was young, you know, I might have uh, bought into this stuff a little bit more than uh, I do today because I, I've been studying it for a while. So actually, that's probably me at about 22 or so. Actually, that's on, uh, that's on the, uh, the coast of the Arctic Ocean, actually. If you look in the background, that's the Arctic Ocean. That's a little lake in between us and the Arctic Ocean. So that's not quite the Arctic Ocean. It's kind of just behind that thing, that big tower, which is what? What's that tower? It's not a weather station. Well, the tower in the front is a weather station, right? What's in the back? It's not a well, power plant, but it's a oil rig, right? It's a oil well. And so, actually, I grew up on the British petroleum oil fields in some respects, I guess, is my... Uh, so I guess my advice to you Buy stock in British Petroleum. <laughs> I did. They were in a pretty good show there. Pretty clean. Actually, that's uh, British Petroleum oil, oil field in uh, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. Uh, from what I understand, is the cleanest oil field in the whole world, actually. So everybody likes to think that, uh, you know, oil companies are kind of dangerous or mean-spirited or they're trying to ruin the planet, all that sort of stuff. But uh, that's just just not the case. So I guess my question to you is, how'd you get here to school today? Got here by a car? Walking, one person walked. How many people took a donkey? <laughs> not many, right? <laughs> so you probably don't want to go back into the Stone Ages, is uh, my point. So, don't crap on technology so much. We're, uh, we're doing all right for ourselves here. All right, what else do we got? Well, like I said, climate's been changing throughout time. Actually, this is a little bit more a close up picture of me on the Arctic Ocean. That's uh, Chen Nu Ping, he's a soil scientist. He te teaches at the uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. So I took a soil science, science class with him. We drove from uh, Fairbanks all the way up to Prudhoe Bay and dug a bunch of holes in the ground and studied permafrost along the way. So that's me standing on the Arctic Ocean. So just trying to show you that I've been there and done that. I'm not just talking on my butt, so to speak. So. All right. So actually, my specialty is cold regions, along with geography in general. Here's me in front of a glacier uh, near Sitka, Alaska. And actually, you can't read that sign, really, but it says, do not proceed beyond this point. Glacier is unstable. It may collapse on you. And so actually, there were a bunch of people climbing up around the glacier. So. <laughs> I was kind of rooting for it to fall on them, but it didn't. Uh, I know I'm such a bad, evil guy. All right. So, well, because I studied cold regions, that's, that's what I'm putting this definition up here for, the cryosphere. So cryosphere, cryos means cold. And so this is any place on the planet where they're below freezing temperatures for at least part of the year. So that includes uh, sea ice. So sea ice is a little bit different than glaciers. Sea ice is ice that forms in the ocean, so that's when the ocean uh, surface freezes. Glaciers, actually when ice freezes on land or when water freezes on land, right? Frozen ground. Frozen ground can be one year or less. Permafrost is actually when ground is frozen for a period of two years or longer. So there are a bunch of different uh, categories. And I just said that, well, climate has been changing throughout geologic history. We know the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. And so, well, this is a map of uh, about 20,000 years ago. And 20,000 years ago, we had what was known as uh, the last glacial maximum. And they call it the last glacial maximum because that's when the glaciers were at their maximum extent in the northern hemisphere to 
the maximum extent to the south and the southern hemisphere maximum extent to the north. And so I guess, well, some people don't even believe the Earth is uh, over 5,000 years old. So I said we should try to base our reasoning on evidence. So what's the evidence? What's the evidence that the climate has actually changed over the last 20,000 years? How do we know that these glaciers were, well, if we look at this map, pretty far into the contiguous United States, actually. They advanced all the way out of Greenland, all the way throughout Canada, all the way into the uh, Pacific Northwest, Upper Midwest, and the Northeast. If you look at Europe, too bad France isn't covered. I wish they would have been covered. But <laughs> Sorry, just joking. You can see how far those glaciers advanced, right? So what's our evidence of that? My favorite hockey team. But their symbol is based on what? What's that a picture of? An island, New York. Long Island, right? Actually, my first geography professor, I, I, I was a student at uh, SUNY Albany. He'd ask people where they're from. And uh, yes, I have, actually. Yeah, yeah. They're going to rip it down soon, too. Well, they're moving to Brooklyn, though. Anyway, yeah, yeah. we'll talk about this later, Phil. But um, so what are we looking here? Well, what he said was people, he would, he would ask students where they were from. And they would say, I'm from the island. And he'd say, what goddamn island? I know of a lot of islands. That's a joke, but. Long Island. So uh, I guess New Yorkers are a little bit, uh, <laughs> they assume that everybody's from New York. So that's a picture of Long Island. And why does it have that shape? So kind of talking about the evidence. And if I kind of recreate that little map, it looks a little bit like that. Why does Long Island? It's 150 miles long maybe 30 or 40 miles thick. There are two big hills that go down the length of it. How was it created? <coughs> by what? Not plate tectonics, glacial ice. So if we look at, these, at this picture, if you could look at that picture, you could see where that kind of dark blue moves down south into North America. That's just about it, New York. And actually, when glaciers move south, or when glaciers move, they act as bulldozers, actually. That, that ice sheet was over a mile thick, right? So it's just pulverizing all the rock. It's actually pushing all the rock ahead of it. And Long Island, well, sometimes it moves forward, and then sometimes it, it gets a little bit warmer. It melts, it moves backwards, and then it'll get a little bit colder or move forward again. So these are called moraines. So actually, what my former geography professor called Long Island was a glacial junk heap. And that's essentially what it is. It's basically a pile of stuff, till, glacial till, rocks that have been pushed forward as the glacier advanced south. And the reason it has those two, what we call lobes, are because the glacier moved back and forward several times. So that's part of our evidence, right? So we have landforms. So like I said, my favorite hockey team has that. Uh, and you can see those two little lobes. What else? And here's a picture of Long Island. So again, you can see those, what I tried to recreate on this little board here. Uh, what else is our evidence? What's, uh, anybody ever been to New York City? Yeah, what's the biggest park in New York City? 
Central Park, very good. And this is a picture of some rocks in Central Park. What do we notice about the rocks? They've been uh, kind of carved over. So like I said, when that glacier moves over the rocks, it kind of pulverizes rocks. Some of those rocks are incorporated into the ice. When it moves over the land surface, it actually acts like sandpaper. So you can see those what are called striations. So those little grooves in the rock actually indicate the direction of movement. So you can go to, uh, you can go to Central Park and actually see exposed bedrock. And you can see where the uh, glacier has moved over the, uh, over the rocks. So a lot of uh, geologic evidence. What else? Um, sea level changes. We can talk all about landforms. I don't want to use up too much time here, but well, my question to you guys now is for the past two and a half million years in Earth's history, we've had many glacial episodes. So many, many periods when the glaciers advanced, many times when they retreated. Usually when they advance, it takes about 100,000 years for them to advance and retreat. And then the warm periods are about 10,000 years. So actually we're in a warm period right now that's about 10,000 years. So actually, if you look at the geologic record, actually, you could probably say it's more likely to get cold than warm. That's why actually in the 70s, people were worried about uh, global cooling, not global warming. We'll get into this in a few seconds. But over the last 3 million years, what's the cause of the glacial episodes in Earth's history? Any ideas, guesses? Simon, what do you think? Well, what's causing all the weather on our planet? The sun, right? The sun's energy. So actually, it is true that most of the glaciers on the planet are melting. Here's a picture of the Greenland ice sheet. It's like a, over a mile thick, and we can see a big hole, and see some water flowing into it. And uh, we can see a glacier here in uh, Argentina, Patagonia where, uh, well, we could see not quite 100 years, but 1928 to 2004. So it has receded, and most glaciers on the planet are receding. So the planet has warmed up, and all estimates say about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit over the last 100 years. How, how significant is that? I don't know. Um, so what's the cause of that warming, I guess? the greenhouse effect, or that's the supposed cause. Well, we know that when we burn fossil fuels, fossil fuels are, are stored solar energy, right? So it's carbon, carbon-based based life. So plants that are uh, deposited in swamps, they make coal. Plants, plankton that are deposited in the oceans, they make oil. When that oil uh, decomposes, it makes natural gas. If we burn that stuff off, it puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So actually, we've been measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, for the last half century or so. And we could see that if we look over the long term, carbon dioxide's going up. So this is kind of the basis of this argument that, well, we're increasing the greenhouse gases, and greenhouse gases do trap that long-wave radiation that's escaping from the Earth, and uh, they keep it in the Earth's atmosphere, and they warm up the planet. If we had no greenhouse effect, there'd be no life on Earth as we know it, actually. So uh, the Earth has always had a greenhouse effect. It's just a ma matter of uh, kind of how strong it is or how weak it is. Mm. Well... If we go back before, let's say, 50 or 60 years ago, before we were taking direct measurements of this carbon dioxide, where do we get our data from? What do we know about, how do we know what the carbon concentration in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide concentration was, let's say, before 1960 or before 19, I guess, about 55? How do we know? The ice cores, right? So actually, th those ice cores, those glaciers that I talked about that are over a mile thick, actually we can drill down into them and we can take samples of those glaciers. And we can look at the little bubbles that are in those, uh, those little air pockets and we can sample the, uh, the air and the gases that are trapped in them. 
So actually, we can measure the amount of uh, carbon dioxide and methane going back over about 500,000 years. So that's a long time. Well, if we look at the last 1,000 years, that line up there, the zero degree line, that's kind of the modern average temperature. And you could see that before the last 100 years, temperature a little bit cooler. And then in the last 100 years, it's increased a little bit. Like I said, over the last 100 years, average temperature by all the estimates has increased by mm, 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Not that much in my opinion. And the whole hypothesis is that, well, uh, sorry, wrong arrow, that we've released greenhouse gases specifically carbon dioxide and methane. And the greenhouse gases have increased in concentration in the atmosphere. The temperature has gotten warmer. And so therefore, the temperature of the Earth has gotten warmer. So that's that little red line that you see down there at the end, right? However, if we go back further in Earth's history, say I told you those ice cores were pretty thick. So if we go back, let's say 300,000 years, what do we notice? The whole hypothesis is that carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere, so the planet's getting warmer because the greenhouse effect is getting stronger. But if we look at the last 300,000 years, the CO2 is represented, or carbon dioxide, represented by the red line, temperature represented by the black line. What's this graph telling us? Is it telling us the same thing? Or is it telling us something different? Which is preceding which? So if we looked here, our hypothesis was we're increasing the greenhouse gas concentration in our atmosphere. Temperature's going up, right? If we look at this graph, I can't have a pointer to reach that far up, but which is preceding which? The carbon dioxide is determining the temperature or the temperature is determining the carbon dioxide? Temperature is determining the carbon dioxide, right? Well, that just really threw a wrench in our whole hypothesis then, right? So this graph is telling us that the temperature is actually determining how much carbon dioxide is in our atmosphere, right? So why is that? Who can explain that? Anybody have any ideas? Why might that be? You're not only the ice, it's also, well, if you guys have a soda, why is your soda bubble? Why does that have bubbles in it? It's carbonated, so there's carbon in the soda, right? Carbonated water. So actually, my question to you, I guess, is if you open up that bottle of soda, is it more likely to explode when the soda bottle is hot or when it's cold? When it's hot, right? So when it's cold, cold water can actually absorb more carbon dioxide. Hot water the carbon wants to come out, so it's actually more fizzy or more bubbly, right? So when actually the planet is warmed up, the carbon comes out of the oceans and goes into the atmospheres and actually into the atmosphere, sorry, and increases uh, the greenhouse effect and actually warms up our planet. So that's what this graph tells us. And so I guess my question to you is, why does that occur? And so why does that occur? So what, over the last three million years or two and a half million years, has been causing these glacial cycles and interglacial cycles, the warm periods in between? You're in a You've heard of Milankovitch, right? Milankovitch cycles, very good. So, well, if you're in my uh, geography classes, I tell you that the Earth's orbit around the sun is constant. And, well, it is constant on a human time scale, but over geologic time, it's not constant, so I lied to you. Don't tell the other students in the class here that I haven't revealed that to them yet, but it varies in a couple of different ways. 
if you look at a uh, little figure A up there, the shape of the Earth's orbit around the sun changes, right? So sometimes it's more circular, sometimes it's more elliptical. So sometimes we're a little bit further from the sun, sometimes we're a little bit closer. Other times, well, what else changes? The Earth's orientation. Mm, ah. Don't have the picture there that I wanted. But um, you can imagine the Earth's seasons are caused by which way the, the Earth is tilted, right? So if this is the Earth, this is the sun. The axis is tilted along that line. When the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, it will be summer. In the northern hemisphere, when it's tilted away from the sun, winter. So actually, the Earth wobbles on that axis. So the timing of the seasons changes. So right now we get winter. When's our winter solstice in the northern hemisphere? December 21st or 22nd. When's the summer solstice? June 21st to 22nd. So depending on how that uh, the Earth is wobbling on its axis, the timing of our seasons changes. And then we have one more change, which is the actual tilt of the Earth. And the tilt determines what? The tropics, right? So right, the angle where the sun's rays can be directly overhead at any given time of the, uh, the year. So we know that the sun's noon rays can only be directly overhead in the tropics, right? From 23 and a half degrees north to 23 and a half degrees south. Because why? Because the angle of the Earth's axis is 23.5 degrees. And again, if you're in my class, I told you that that was constant. But again, I lied. It, wobble, it wobbles a little bit. It moves a little bit between uh, 22 and 24 degrees. So actually, we're changing the, the latitudes of the, of the tropics and of the Antarctic and Arctic circles. And the Arctic and Antarctic circles, those are the latitudes where what? We can get what? 24 hours of darkness and 24 hours of daylight, right? So we can see how all these changes are affecting the Earth's climate. And so if you take all three of these, the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, the tilt, and the precession of the equinoxes or the solstices, and you combine them all, we come up with this combined effect. We call that a composite curve. Insulation down here, that just means incoming solar radiation. So that's just how much radiation we're receiving from the sun. And we could see that that line, it gets a little bit wavy there. So when it's really, uh, when it's high, that means that's going to be a little warm period. When it's lower, those are the glacial periods. So that's how our orbital parameters determine our, our climate. And so who came up with that idea is uh, Milankovitch. He's a Yugoslavian meteorologist. Kind of put all this, uh, all this together, associated with uh, the geologic data from the last 300,000 years. So, where am I? Well, we can model this now because actually I spent a lot of time doing uh, Fortran modeling of of climate, and well, you could see this goes back uh, about 25,000 years, and Greens represent warmer temperatures, so the modern temperature is kind of this last one here down at the bottom right, 20,000 years before present, that's the upper left. So you can see that blue area has gotten bigger, right? So that means it was colder 20,000 years ago, and basically that's because of those, those orbital parameters changing. So all these changes over the last three million years are pretty much driven by these uh, Milankovitch cycles. Well, I guess this might be where I leave off. I'm a stickler. But if we read this statement, as a scientist, you have to stick to what you know and to what the evidence suggests. I mean, this is just a one random quote that I pulled out of a little article about climate change. 
I know, stick to what you know. What does that mean? I stick to what? A scientist should stick to what? The scientific what? Scientific method, right? So that's a process that we use. Well, again, it's a tool. So just like maps are tools, the scientific method's a tool, right? Scientific method is a tool that we use to do what? Discover verifiable truth, right? And it should be replicatable. So we should, any experiments that we do, somebody else should be able to come along, do the same experiments, and get the same results. So it's not sticking to what you know, right? It's what can we prove using the scientific method? And, well, just my last criticism there is uh, what the evidence suggests, people suggest, data indicates. So that's just another little bit of uh, my criticism of use of the English language there. So I um, guess I see people rustling around. And actually, I think I'm uh, out of time. And I have a few more, few more minutes here for questions. So I think I have about five minutes for questions. So I guess that's where I'll leave you guys off. And uh, just one thing, if, uh, if you're in one of my classes and you're supposed to get extra credit or you're supposed to put your name on one of those pieces of papers, just make sure your name's on one of those pieces of papers. And I'm sure I'll get it if you pass it to the front. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your attendance. Uh, it's an honor to speak before you guys.